Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Kelly Pirtle with NOAA Communications in Norman, Oklahoma, and I'm a member of NOAA's Central Region Collaboration Team. And I'm your host for today's webinar. We're excited that you're here. Today's five-minute thesis webinar has been organized by the NOAA Central Region Collaboration Team as a way to increase knowledge and awareness of projects and research in specific areas. In this case, space weather. The webinar format is based on a model used by universities across the country as a way to briefly share information about a project, an initiative, or research. Each presenter you will hear from today will have five minutes and two slides to cover their topic. You can see from the agenda, we have a variety of topics and they are divided into three sections. We also have presenters from NOAA, NASA, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, and United Airlines. After each section, we will take a break for questions from you, our audience, for each group of presenters. And at the end, we will have a few minutes for all panelists to respond to your questions. So at any point during the presentations, please submit your questions in writing using the questions pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. Bethany Perry, the coordinator for the NOAA Central Region Collaboration Team, will collect all of the questions for our Q&A sessions throughout the webinar. And the good news is we are recording today's webinar and it will be available for viewing by anyone who was in, unable to attend today. We plan to have the recording posted this coming Monday on the NOAA Central Region Collaboration Team website. That is www.regions.noaa.gov central. Our previous webinars on severe weather, citizen science, and the value of social science and weather forecasting are linked there as well. We'd love to get your feedback on this event. Please take a moment at the conclusion of today's webinar to complete a very brief survey. Now, during today's presentation, everyone except the presenters will be in listen-only mode. If you experience any technical problems, please use the questions pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. With that, we're ready to begin. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Howard Singer, Chief Scientist at NOAA's Space Weather Prediction Center. Howard has graciously agreed to provide introductions for each of our expert presenters today. Thank you, Kelly. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to introduce our speakers. This first session is an introduction to space weather and covers topics ranging from understanding space weather causes to examining its impacts to preparing forecasts for those impacted by space weather. As you listen to today's presentation, you may take note of comparisons to the work many of you do in other National Weather Service activities related to water, climate, and tropospheric weather, and learn about the federal agencies, academic institutions, commercial organizations, and international partnerships that are important for providing space weather services. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speak speaker, Dr. Jari Collado Vega, a research astrophysicist at the NASA's Community Coordinated Modeling Center. The CCMC is a remarkable resource in the space science community for running space science and space weather models for research and to evaluate the models for possible transition to operations. Jari's research focuses on understanding space environment processes and their effect on the near Earth space. So, Dr. Colado Vega, please take it away. Thank you, Howard. Uh, welcome, everybody. They asked me to kick off the event today, and I'm really grateful. Thank you so much for the invitation. Like Howard said, my name is Jari Collado Vega, and I'm the Space Weather Forecasting Team Lead for the Community Coordinated Modeling Center, CCNC, and NASA Goa Space Flight Center. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about what exactly is space weather and its effects in the near Earth environment. Tell me a little bit more about CCMC. CCMC is a multi-partnership agency 
that whole state-of-the-art space water model. Can you go to the previous slide, please? Yes, thank you. That whole state-of-the-art space water models to have them available for the scientific community to use. Here on the slide, you can see all the models that we have available. We have more than 80 models active right now, and they cover pretty much every domain, going all the way from the sun to the, how the solar wind travels to the heliosphere, and also the magnetic field of the Earth, what we call the magnetosphere, and the inside of the magnetosphere. This, having this model uh, in-house goes within two goals of the CCMC. First is to facilitate the space weather research to the scientific community, and secondly, to facilitate the deployment of the next generation space weather models and tools. And that's why they have an experimental group, which is the one that I lead, that does experimental analysis on space weather to understand if the models are given the right results and if they're ready for operation. So now, next slide, talking a little bit more about space weather and what it is. When we talk a little bit about space weather, we're actually talking about the conditions in space that are mostly uh, dominated by the sun's activity. The sun, thanks to the sun, we have life here on Earth. But the sun can have also solar storms. And they come in different types. One of them, you can see here in the first movie, is a solar flare. There we go. A solar flare is an abrupt eruption of radiation it happens to the speed of light, okay? So it gets here in eight minutes. A flare is something really difficult to predict because you have to predict it before it happens. When you see it here, it's already here. Another type of event is a coronal mass ejection. You can see it in the second movie. A coronal mass ejection now is an eruption of an ejection of particles from the solar corona, billions of particles that travel across the whole solar system and they can arrive at planets, at, at different missions across the solar system and also at Earth. A lot of people confuse the flares and the CMEs, but they're very different things. Um, these two events actually can accelerate particles, high energetic particles. Those are the ones that we call solar energetic particles. They accelerate them to the fraction of the speed of light. And these are the particles that actually have caused most of the damage to the instrumentation of satellites in space and can create a hazardous environment to the astronauts in space. Now, on the next movie that you have on the left down corner, this is actually a visualization uh, done with simulation data of a CME arriving at Earth <clears throat> coming from the sun, okay? And here you can see that we are actually protected from this solar particle because we have a magnetic shield. We have what we call the magnetosphere. However, there's a lot of energy transfer that happens when this event actually arrive at Earth. And you know, there's a lot of disturbances that are caused to the magnetic field of the Earth, which we call the geomagnetic storm. And after this, we can also see the aurora. Many effects happen when this solar storm arrives at Earth and at other uh, locations in space. And I'm just gonna mention some of them because the next presenter is gonna be explaining them in more detail. But we know we can have damage to instrumentation of satellites in space, like I already said, uh, problems in, in um, communications, GPS signal loss, problems in avionics, and when there's a really strong geomagnetic storm, we can have power grid disruption. It has happened before that cities have been without power because of the solar activity. And lastly, but not less important, you know, we wanna understand how to forecast this hazardous environment, this radiation environment, because we wanna protect the astronauts outside of space. We wanna send astronauts to the moon, we wanna send them to Mars, and to do this safely, we have to be able to forecast this radiation environment. And that's why my team works really close with other organizations to understand if the models are ready for operations, to see if we can make the right assessment, and to see if we can communicate that assessment to the mission and also in the future to the human exploration activity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jari, for that illuminating overview of the processes that impact Earth's space weather. Our next presenter is Bill Murtaugh, Program Coordinator at NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center. Bill plays a large role in guiding and coordinating interagency efforts to improve our nation's preparedness for the impacts of space weather events. Bill will discuss the impact of space weather on critical infrastructure in space and on Earth. Bill, whenever you're ready. Thanks, Howard, and thanks 
Yari. Uh, yeah, this is a little bit on the why we care piece. Space weather affects many of the technologies we rely on for everyday activities. In fact, it's interesting, we've created vulnerability unlike any other because of our reliance on these advanced technologies. These losses and any of these systems could have profound consequences on the nation. And let's just talk about a few of them. You'll see the image there in the upper left-hand side. Yari just mentioned that the grid, when these big CMEs hit Earth's magnetic field and create a geomagnetic storm, it induces current, it flows into the power grid, and it can cause transformer overheating, voltage instability, and even in a worst case, a power grid collapse. So grid operators need this information. It's one of our biggest customers across the United States and Canada to take action to mitigate the impact. Fortunately, we've got uh, Mark Olson from the North American Electric Reliability Corporation who will give us more details on this in a few minutes. Other long, other long electrical conductor systems also get affected. What are we talking about there? Railway lines, pipelines are also impacted by space weather events. Another big customer, and it's kind of customer, and it's kind of captured throughout this this um, collage of, of of pictures here, and it's GPS users. GPS pervades society today. Uh, most of us use GPS to get from point A to point B, but there are so many other uses. Just for example, on the left-hand side, you'll see the tractor. Precision agriculture is a multi-billion dollar industry in this country today. Those folks are using GPS, looking for centimeter accuracy. So they can plant seeds, they can irrigate, they can fertilize, and they can do it at three o'clock in the morning because it's, you don't need the light of day when you're relying on GPS. When there's a big ionospheric storm, a space weather storm, it uh, can affect the accuracy of, of the GPS. And the, if these farmers don't want to deal with it, they'll get notification and they'll just postpone activities for a day or two. On the upper right-hand side, you'll see all the ships involved in drilling and surveying of the ocean. Other, they're another big customer relying extensively on high-precision GPS activities. And of course, the satellite industry. Right now, we have 2,000 or thereabouts active satellites. In the next decade, with SpaceX, Amazon, and the OneWeb plans, we expect to see as many as 60,000 satellites in operations in orbit. These satellites, when the space weather events occur, they'll heat the atmosphere and increase drag in the lower Earth orbit. And this is not a good thing. The orbit, the satellite operators have to know when that's happened so they can take action as so to, to avoid any collisions. So space weather is very important for satellites and not just for satellite drag, it also affects the microchip technology and, and can create electrostatic discharges that can be very problematic for the satellite operators. Aviation is another big uh, um, customer for space weather services. It can affect communications, navigation, and exposure, radiation exposure to passengers and crew. And fortunately, we have United Airlines on the line today to talk more details about their concerns for space weather. Next slide, please. And just to talk of some examples of impacts, just over the last six, seven, eight years or so, you'll see I just used some headlines to illustrate that space weather occurs all the time. It's not just during these extreme events. You'll see some things here. You'll see where in the center, the solar flares interfere with radio networks' ability to warn people during Hurricane Irma. So we've got a Category 4, a Category 5 hurricane bearing down on, on the nation and the Caribbean. And all of a sudden, we've got solar flares interfering with our ability to communicate with people who need that information. So it's kind of a worst-case scenario when we already have one emergency in progress, and now we're going to complicate things by introducing space weather. It happened in 2017. You'll see there how solar flare knocked out the light squared satellite and back in 2012. Fortunately for those folks, they recovered. It took about uh, three weeks or so to recover that satellite. And up the top center, that New York Times headline, you'll see solar flare knocks out flight control system in Sweden. The Swedish airspace lost, um, they lost the ability to track the air traffic controllers, lost the ability to track the aircraft in the entire uh, Swedish airspace and they shut down the system for about an hour due to one of these solar flares. So you can see just the story here, a space weather does occur, it occurs all the time at any stage of the solar cycle and uh, it can have significant consequences. And the last thing I just want to touch on is extreme space weather. That's our biggest concern because it will have global effects 
unlike most other natural disasters, ironically, the other one that's often pointed to with a global effect is what? Pandemic, and we know all about that today. Space weather is similar, it can have, it can have global effects. Recent studies have suggested the impact in the United States could range right up to $40 billion or so a day during one of these extreme events. And that last piece there you'll see is very significant because it indicates a pretty high probability of an extreme event, a 10% chance over the next decade. So space weather events do cause substantial harm to our nation's security and economic vitality. And it's critical that we improve our ability to understand, predict, and prepare for space weather events. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for that great overview of space weather impacts. Next, we have up Bob Rutledge, Space Weather Forecast Office Section Lead at NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center. In addition to the breadth of activities that Bob manages, he has a wealth of experience and knowledge when it comes to Earth's radiation environment and the impacts on human spaceflight and aviation. In this presentation, Bob will explain just how space weather forecasts are made. Bob, take it away. Thank you very much, Howard. And uh, thank you to my colleagues, Jari and Bill, for the great introduction. Uh, so I don't have to, to introduce these terms without the, the great movies that Jari uh, showed. I also see over 300 now in attendance. Thank you very much for that. And thank you very much for the interest. I'm not sure what's more intimidating, staring at 300 faces or that number. Um, but appreciate you being here. And we uh, are space weather. We use the term weather, although a lot of a lot of uh, differences than uh, weather as we know it, and really the state of weather forecasting and, and the level of sophistication of the models. So, I have the pleasure of walking you through the uh, forecast process. And I think what I really need to do first is is uh, reintroduce or talk about the sunspots. So, if you look at the image in the upper left, the yellow image, that is a a pretty busy sun. So that's the sun back in October. Uh, late October of 2003, arguably the last series of really extreme space weather events, and that is is the sun that really puts the space weather community on edge. I did not use the sun from today because we are at or near our solar minimum, so just really a couple tiny spots. So today's forecast wouldn't be that interesting. It's a pretty easy forecast that nothing really significant is going to happen. But when we get a sun, as we saw it in late October 2003, um, we, we see lots of eruptions, and we see that we have several large complex sunspot groups on the sun, but saying exactly what will happen and exactly when it will happen is pretty challenging at that point. So we, we, when we're seeing those sunspots, we're really in the probabilistic phase of the forecast. If you could look magnetically at the sun, that's that black and white image to the, to the bottom left, and those are different polarities. So when we get the uh, complex regions that have two opposite polarities, next to each other, that's when we get those explosive releases of, of energy and on a very, very large scale. So jumping to the middle panel and, and Jari introduced this, but the solar flare. So really, as she said, once we start measuring it with our imager in the upper green panel or with our X-ray sensor on the GO spacecraft, that event is already here. It's already affecting the day side of the earth. So unfortunately our, in our business and many smart people trying to solve this and get us to that next step, but we're, really we're reactionary to the solar flares. So we, we have a pretty good chance at saying solar flares are likely, but really then we just have to start alerting the community once one of those starts to take place. And that, uh, that is a three day plot, that line, line plot, that's the X-ray output, it is a log plot. So you can see we get orders of magnitude changes over tens of, uh, tens of minute time scales. And we can get lots of flares, especially when we get a sun like we had in October of 2003, that produce a lot of events. So once we get that flare, we start looking for the other pieces that were mentioned, the radiation storm. Again, there's not much notice on that. Those particles move at large fractions of the speed of light. And in some cases, we've seen those arrive at Earth and cross thresholds even before the flare peak, such as in uh, January of 2005. So not a lot of lead time on those uh, as well. And the last piece, the, the piece that really was uh, the centerpiece in, in what Bill talked about is that geomagnetic storm piece. And fortunately for us, it has some of the most grave consequences with the potential risk to the power grid. But because of the nature of that phenomenon, we have some ability to, to provide some warning. So that process starts 
with the two images you see on the right, those are what we call coronagraph images. So those are both taken from the sun earth line. So that's as if you're looking at the sun from earth, of course, and the sun would sit behind that small white circle. So we've created an artificial eclipse. So we can see those portions of the outer atmosphere being explosively blown into space and they're dim compared to the bright sun itself. So we have to occult the sun. So the image in the upper right, that uh, red one, that's kind of, uh, when you look at this and when the forecasters look at this, you try and decide essentially, is it headed at Earth or not? And quite likely the one in the red is, is kind of going away from us, you know, up and, up and to the right, so to speak. However, the, the pane in the, in the bottom in the middle, uh, the blue movie, you can see that it's a halo or a donut. So that is either going straight away from us or coming straight towards us. And in this case, we can correlate that with like a big flare, as you see in that green panel on the front side. And we know that that is, is coming toward us. We, we use that imagery to try and, try and see if there's a coronal mass ejection associated with the big flare, because it is not every uh, big flare has a significant CME or significant CME headed towards Earth. Next slide, if I could, please. So at that phase, working from the left, and this is to, to credit for what Jari introduced, is the, the great uh, basic and applied research communities uh, developing tools to improve our predictive capabilities. And this is exactly what happened. In this case, this colored pinwheel diagram in the left, upper left, is the WSA MLO movie. So those two colored pinwheels, you're staring down on the top of the ecliptic plane, so the top of the the sun, and you can see kind of a sprinkler pattern there, and the small dot to the right is Earth. So we can take these images, as shown in the tool in the bottom left, we can take the images of the CME and try and get an assessment of what direction it's headed and how fast it's going, and then put that in that tool to the upper left and refine estimates of arrival time. However, I haven't talked about intensity yet, and that's a big unknown at that point. So we live with a lot of uncertainty at the longer range forecast phase of, of our business. So if, as my colleague Mark Olson will talk later, if we saw that event from late October of 2003, the best I could tell Mark is that, hey, something big, maybe really big, maybe not, is gonna happen in you know 12 to 18 hours. And that is still useful because it's better than not giving any warning at all, but ideally uh, the holy grail in our business is continuing to work towards intensity forecasting, but we just can't remotely observe those parameters. So really moving to the panel in the middle. So we see the CME, we don't have great information on the magnetic strength or orientation. That's really going to drive how strongly it couples with the, the Earth system uh, as, as clearly shown in, in the model that uh, Jari showed earlier. And so we sit and we wait for that data and we fly a real-time solar wind mission. Uh, so we have the Discover spacecraft up, up there now, uh, the ACE, uh, spacecraft preceded that, and that sits at a point, kind of a stable gravitational point we call the L1 Lagrange point. So if you take a line between the sun and the earth, it sits 1 million miles upstream of earth. So that's only 1 million of that 93, so it's a small fraction of the distance, but based on the size of the earth versus the size of the sun and how those tug on that spacecraft, that's, that's where we can park that. Ideally, we'd like more lead time, but that's kind of uh, orbital mechanics working against us there. So we sit and we wait, and what happens is what I've uh, circled in red there is then we see on on number of parameters there, speed, magnetic field, we see that big discontinuity that I've circled, and that's when that cloud gets to Earth, and when we see that shock, and then once we see the, the strength and orientation of the magnetic field, then we start to, to be able to provide more information about the strength of, of the storm, the corresponding impacts that we expect on systems. And really, that's, that's where we're making uh, tremendous progress in recent years, is that short-term forecasting uh, paradigm. So once we know what the solar wind measurement is, we can drive physics-based models uh, to describe, I've shown in the upper right, the top panel is the aurora forecast. So it will take that solar wind input and try and determine where is aurora likely visible. And we do get a little bit of lead time, because again, that's a million miles upstream, so you can get 10 or tens of minutes lead time. The middle panel is the, uh, an impact product for the electric power grid, showing the types of induced electric fields that would show up on power lines. And I'm talking the big, big power lines, the 200,000 volt and above power lines, so really the bulk power system. And then in the bottom, and this will come back uh, later as uh, uh, Nathan presents, but really 
Another example of a product, and this is the impact on high frequency communication. So what can be used in, in one of Bill's examples was uh, you know, a patch of impact blocking out high frequency communication. So in the example Bill showed, um, they would be able to look at this graphic, even though we couldn't tell them a day ahead of time, they'd be able to look at this and say, we can't reach that aircraft flying from French Guiana because the communication system is likely blacked out from the sun. So it helps make that decision uh, whether or not to dispatch search and rescue or just you know, chalk it up to the environmental impact. Um, and again, in the, in the not as pretty a box up there, but all of the watch warnings and alerts, again, all the text products that really go with all of this as well. So that, in a nutshell, the short version is the space weather forecasting paradigm. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Bob. We will now take a few minutes to address some of the questions submitted from the audience. Remember, you can type your questions in the questions pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. Bethany? Thanks, Kelly. We've had a couple of questions come in. Um, the first uh, is directed towards Bill, and are there some examples of past extreme events that you can share? Yeah, yes, there's, there's a, I'll, I'll, I'll pick just a couple. I think the, the one, kind of the benchmark, if you will, is the September 1, September 1st and 2nd Carrington event. It was an extraordinary event, and and most of our um, most of our scientists would agree that it it was probably the largest event in anywhere from one to the last five hundred years. And it was interesting. At the t a couple of things to point out about that event that make it really interesting is we talk about the impacts on technology today. There was technology back then that was impacted too. We had a telegraph system, and it was a big ground conductor. And the in the geomagnetic storm induced currents just like it does with the grid in that telegraph system, and it caused all sorts of chaos with their ability to communicate back then, including creating fires on some of the telegraph stations that's well documented in the historical record. Another element in that particular event that's really interesting in 1859 was the uh, the aurora. Now our friends up north in, in Alaska and Canada, Scandinavia are used to seeing the aurora. What was it like on 1 and 2 September 1859 when the people in Cuba looked up and saw the northern lights? It's kind of a proxy measurement of how intense the magnetic storm was. The aurora extended that far south that was visible in the Caribbean and, and Mexico. So that's kind of one of the big events that's really, that's the one, if we have an event like that today, that, that's what concerns us, a Carrington class event. We often reference to it and what it might do to our technology today. I'll just mention one other, and it was the 1972 event it happened in August of 72, and it was really interesting. Fortunately, it happened between two uh, Apollo missions when the astronauts were on, on the moon. The consequence on those astronauts could have been quite significant had it occurred when they were on the moon. But one other piece to that, it's just recent um, news that came out. It was uh, research done by Dolores Knipp at CU, and that was, there was a whole bunch of mines in, the, it was during the Vietnam era, the Vietnam War era, and a whole bunch of naval mines erupted, exploded, and nobody knew why they were exploding. There was no ships in the area. It was, in fact, the magnetic field from the geomagnetic storm, storm the, geo the induced current uh, triggered those sensitive mines, and, they, and dozens exploded. Nobody could quite understand why at the time, but they certainly realize now what caused it. So those are just two events that are, are benchmark events that we often refer to now. Uh, when we um, are trying to establish how big is big. Thanks for the question. Sure. Thanks, Bill. And then the second one that I've, I've got ready, uh, Jari, this one's for you. How much time do solar storms take to arrive at Earth? Um, so it depends on each event, right? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, solar flares, you know, once you see the signal for the solar flares already here, the travel to, fresh, uh, travel to the speed of light, so they get here in eight minutes. They get to Earth in eight minutes. Um, now, a CME, a coronal mass ejection, that, that will be different. This is an ejection of particles from the solar corona. And depending on their speed, they take two to four days to arrive at Earth. Depending on where you are also in the solar system, you will have a different timeline. 
Um, now, the soil jetted particles, like Bob mentioned in his presentation, these are particles that accelerated to fractions of the speed of light. So sometimes, you know, they could get here in half an hour, two hours. That's the timeline of a solar jetted particle event. So this, depending on the event, you have different timelines on when they can arrive at Earth. Because of the CME having that timeline of two to four days, we have more time, right, to understand and analyze this event and then do the forecasting part. So I do believe myself, and I'm pretty sure it, um, most of the panelists agree with me, we have the best forecasting capabilities when we talk about CME. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and now to stay on time, we're gonna mosey on, but um, folks that have uh, entered questions, don't worry, we'll try to get back to as many of those as we can towards the end of the webinar. Okay, Howard, back to you. Okay, thank you, Bethany. This next section in the program is focused on observations and modeling. Together with understanding space weather, observations and models form the foundation for space weather services. The space domain includes the sun, interplanetary space, everywhere humans and spacecraft might venture, and even cosmic rays from distant galaxies. With all that territory to cover, we rely on many types of observations, as well as models to fill in the gaps and forecast into the future. So let's begin this section with Dr. Terry Onsager, a physicist from NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center. Terry plays a major role in coordinating international space weather activities, and today he will cover space weather observations, which are a backbone of NOAA's predictive capabilities. Terry, you're on. Thank you, Howard. I'll give a brief overview of space weather observations, but first I want to stress the enormous volume we need to monitor and to contrast that with terrestrial weather. Terrestrial weather needs observations in a thin skin around Earth, extending about one one hundredth of an Earth radius above the surface. Space weather, on the other hand, requires observations on the surface of the Earth, in near-Earth space where our satellites and astronauts operate, and then through interplanetary space to the sun. We do our best to fill this volume using measurements on the ground and with satellites in low Earth orbit, in geostationary orbit, and at the L1 Lagrange point in the solar wind upstream from Earth. As an upstream buoy about a million miles from Earth in the solar wind, a satellite at L1 gives our most accurate warnings of disturbances coming from the sun. L1's a special location where a satellite always stays upstream from Earth as the satellite and Earth orbit the sun. The two satellites we use to monitor the solar wind and the sun are NOAA's Deep Space Climate Observatory, or DISCOVER, and the NASA ESA Solar and Heliophysics Observatory, or SOHO. When, when a coronal mass ejection is emitted from the sun, the chronograph on SOHO shows this as a brightening that expands outward, these images are used to estimate the speed and direction of CMEs, and this gives us one to four days warning before the CMEs reach Earth, as you've heard from the other panelists. Discover is not imaging the sun, but rather it's measuring the local solar wind, giving us high reliability knowledge of what will impact Earth in about 45 minutes to an hour. It's measuring the magnetic field magnitude and direction and the plasma density, speed, and temperature. Inside the magnetosphere, we depend on NOAA's GOES satellites in geostationary orbit, one off the east coast of the US and one off the west coast. Although the main GOES instruments are pointed at Earth and measuring atmospheric phenomena and weather on Earth, GOES also has a set of solar monitoring instruments on the solar panel yoke that are always viewing the sun and always looking out for changes in solar activity that will drive space weather. From this vantage point, GOES continuously measures the solar X-ray intensity, and it makes multiple images each minute of the sun's ultraviolet emissions. These images show the structures in the solar atmosphere and the regions of concentrated energy that can erupt and cause space weather storms. The solar flare illustrated here was the first major flare of the new solar cycle that's just now beginning. GOES is also measuring the energetic protons accelerated near the sun and in front of the CMEs. As you've seen in today's presentations, these radiation storms impact radio communication, satellite operations, commercial aviation, and human space exploration. 
as important as measuring what's coming from the sun, GOES is also measuring the consequences of space weather locally inside the magnetosphere. Energetic protons and electrons are shown in the upper two panels and the magnetic fields in the lower panel. The figure on the right shows how these data were used to understand the cause of a disruption of service from the Galaxy 15 communication satellite in 2010. From low Earth orbit, we use Cosmic 2 satellite constellation with GPS receivers to remotely sense the ionosphere just above the atmosphere. We ingest satellite data and ground-based data into data simulation models, and that gives us a global view of space weather conditions that impact navigation and communication. In addition, we rely heavily on a global network of ground-based magnetometers measuring the local magnetic field. Five are shown here. These measurements are the basis for the geomagnetic storm alerts we issue for storms that impact the electric power grid and other ground-based assets, as you've heard. And finally, we also use measurements of the sun from the ground, and we continuously receive data from the L1 satellites. Measurements of the photospheric magnetic field drive our model of the background solar wind, and images in various wavelengths show the structure and evolution of solar active regions. So using all these measurements, we do our best to fill in this enormous volume from the sun to the earth. I happen to know that uh, Terry worked very hard writing the code for those beautiful and instructive animations. So thank you, Terry. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Michelle Cash, Research Section Lead for NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center. Michelle continues to play a major role in advancing our capabilities for transitioning research to operations. Today, she will talk about developing and advancing space weather forecast capabilities. Michelle, you're on. Thank you, Howard. At the Space Weather Prediction Center, we have models that cover the entire sun to Earth system. This figure provides an overview of these models, with the current operational models shown in white and models that are currently under development in gray. Starting with the sun and solar wind, we have our coupled wang shealy rg Inlow model, known as the WSA Inlow model. This model is named after three people who developed it, and Inlow, the Sumerian god of air, wind, and storms. The WSA Inlow model provides one to four day advanced warnings of solar wind structures and earth-directed coronal mass ejections, also known as CMEs that cause geomagnetic storms. This model uses solar photospheric magnetic field maps as input and provides prediction of the direction and arrival time of CMEs. Next, we have the geospace model, a global magnetohydrodynamics model of Earth's magnetosphere. This model characterizes the geomagnetic response to changes in the solar wind and provides regional predictions of geomagnetic storm timing and severity in support of our electric power customers. Another model that supports our electric power customers is the regional geoelectric E-field model, which uses measurements of the rate of change of the magnetic field at Earth's surface to predict the regional electric fields and the associated currents that impact electric power grids. Our most popular model with the general public is the Ovation Aurora Forecast Model which shows the intensity and location of the aurora. This is a probability forecast based on current solar wind conditions. Finally, for the ionosphere and thermosphere, we are currently in the process of transitioning into operations, the coupled whole atmosphere model and the ionosphere, plasmasphere, and electrodynamics model, known as the combined WAM-IPE model. This model uses solar wind parameters as input and characterizes details of the neutral atmosphere from the ground to about 600 kilometers, as well as provides information about the ionosphere and plasmasphere out to several Earth radii in order to provide a forecast of the environment impacting global navigation system satellites, um, communication systems, and collision avoidance for space traffic management. As you can see from the description of these various models, Many of these models depend on observations of the sun and in situ measurements of the solar wind just upstream of Earth. And this is because the magnetosphere is a highly driven system. 
One of the ways in which we are advancing our space weather forecasting capabilities is by using the output from one model to drive another model. Here you see the output from the geospace model, which is displayed in the space weather forecast office. The geospace model provides gridded information about delta B, the local time varying magnetic field. Using the output from the geospace model, we can compute dBdt, the rate of change of the magnetic field at Earth's surface. We can then use dBdt to drive the regional geoelectric field model. By using one model to drive another, we will be able to provide our customers with longer lead times. The forecasters use the guidance provided by the models to issue geomagnetic storm warnings. These warnings are important for our customers, such as the electric power industry, who in the past have suffered transformer winding failures and transformer overheating from space weather events. NOAA continues to work hard towards providing a modeling framework that captures the critical domains of the Sun-Earth system. As you've seen today, space weather is caused by a series of interconnected events that begin at the sun and end in the near Earth space environment. Recently, NOAA has begun working in collaboration with NASA and NSF to further advance our modeling and forecasting capabilities through the creation of a tri-agency operations to research, also known as O2R grants program. This program, which we began in 2018, has already issued five different O2R grant calls, ranging in topic from solar wind modeling, satellite radiation modeling, and satellite drag. Through opportunities such as these, we will advance our space weather forecasting capabilities by engaging the wider space weather community, as well as our essential public and private sectors, whose input is critical in order to improve the quality of the products and services that we provide to our customers to ensure a space weather ready nation. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. I'm learning so much and I hope you all are too. We will now take a few minutes to address some of the questions submitted by you all. Uh, do you have a question? Type it in the questions pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. Bethany? Thanks, Kelly. Uh, yeah, we've got some questions coming in. And Terry, let me ask, uh, I think this first one for you. Um, what's the biggest challenge you have trying to use all the different measurements from all of the different locations? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, and I think it, it comes down to that enormous volume that we have to measure uh, that I mentioned that we have a lot of measurements at a whole variety of, of locations. And what we really need to do, which is, is the backbone of what uh, Michelle talked about, is to tie them all together, to use the, 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 the modeling capabilities that we have uh, to try and fill that volume with the information our customers need, even though our measurements are so sparse. So, so that, that's the biggest challenges stitching them all together for a global picture. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, I've got a question for you. Um, are there other bodies in space that produce significant impacts on our space weather? So the, the sun is, is the main source of space weather. So it starts at the sun, that's where you have your solar flares, your coronal mass ejections, and then those propagate towards Earth. And so that's the main thing that's driving space weather. Thanks, and Terry, another one for you. Um, what new observations is NOAA planning to make in the future? I, that, that's a very exciting area because right now NOAA is, is looking very seriously at what the future observing capability uh, needs to be. Uh, so for example, uh, the the uh, low Earth orbit op observations of the ionosphere I mentioned were primarily at the lower latitudes. We're, we're looking to a commercial partnership in the near future to get observations at the high latitudes as well, as well. So we'll be monitoring the ionosphere over the entire globe. And I don't know if you remember from 
The diagram that I showed of the sun and the L1 location between the sun and the earth, I'm not, and that diagram, I didn't mention it, but there was also what's called the L5 location, which is off the earth sun line, looking at the sun and the earth from the side. And we're looking forward to having new measurements on a satellite at that location so we can get a, a more accurate measurement of these coronal mass ejections and improve the, the forecast lead time of them. Those are just two of the many areas that are being looked at for future observations. Great. Thank you, Terry. Well, that looks to be all the questions that we've got for this particular session. So, Howard, I will pass it on back to you. Okay. Thank you, Bethany. This final section of the program is focused on impacts and customer response. Uh, in this section, we'll hear from three customer groups that are impacted by space weather airlines, power grids, human space exploration, as well as hearing about the aurora. The aurora is one of the most well-known and beautiful manifestations of space weather and involves a customer group interested in when and where they will occur, as well as a customer group that's interested in the aurora because of its location that's related to impacts on communications, navigation, geomagnetic disturbances, so let's begin with our first talk in this section about the impacts on customers by, by hearing from Nathan Polderman with United Airlines. United has been an important NOAA space weather customer for many years, and Nathan will be covering space weather support for air safety. Nathan? Thank you, Howard, and good afternoon, everyone. I'd just like to spend a few minutes outlining how we at United Airlines manage the risk of space weather events to our operation. So why is this important to our business? Well, United is one of several global air carriers that operate long haul nonstop service from the US to Asia on markets such as Newark, New Jersey and Chicago to Hong Kong or Beijing or Shanghai. As you can see in the graphic here, the shortest route for many of these flights is over the top via what are known as North Polar routes. And these routes traverse latitudes above 78 degrees north, and in some cases fly within a few degrees either side of the geographic North Pole. Because solar flares disproportionately impact the higher latitudes, space weather events may directly impede our ability to operate these flights safely and efficiently. Reverting to a non-polar route or a non-optimal cruising altitude in many cases adds enough flight time to exceed our crew duty time limits or aircraft operational limits, forcing the flight to cancel or incur a significant delay. So if we go to the next slide, just provide an overview. So how do we mitigate the operational impacts associated with space weather? Federal law requires that the airlines maintain rapid and reliable two-way communications over our entire route of flight. In a radio blackout event, high energy particles from solar flares degrade the propagation of high frequency radio waves, which are used by flight crews to communicate with air traffic control, or other ground support facilities. To mitigate this risk, many of our larger, more modern jets are now being equipped with advanced satellite-based communication or SATCOM systems that incorporate frequency bands less susceptible to solar activity. These are some of the same systems that allow you to access the internet while flying over the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Consequently, as airlines have become less reliant on traditional HF, the actual risk to our operation from radio blackouts is very low. In a geomagnetic storm event, high energy particles may attenuate the transmission of GPS satellite signals, which are used to determine precise three-dimensional position. In the last 15 to 20 years, the air traffic system has been adopting precise satellite-based navigation procedures that allow properly equipped aircraft to operate more efficiently at reduced separation and without relying on ground-based navigational aids. So in a strong geomagnetic storm, some of these routes or procedures may become unavailable, forcing airlines like United to revert to less optimal routings 
or incur delays due to the increased separation of traffic in a congested airspace. However, you will be happy to know that unlike your iPhone, modern airliners are equipped with sophisticated multi-input and triple redundant flight management computer systems and can set na navigate safely even when GPS signals are temporarily unavailable or degraded. Therefore, as with radio blackouts, the overall risk of these storms to our operation is also low. Finally, and most importantly, are the risks posed by solar radiation storms. Unlike other phenomena, a solar radiation storm may develop suddenly over a period of minutes, potentially exposing flight crews and passengers to elevated levels of harmful radiation. And this is mainly for flights operating above 60 degrees north latitude and above 30,000 feet in altitude. So at United, we take these events very seriously and will act quickly to alter flight plans for any observed or forecast event deemed to be moderate or greater by the Space Weather Prediction Center. These actions include immediately suspending all flights through North Polar airspace, rerouting or diverting flights that are already en route, or implementing significant altitude restrictions, in some cases of 5,000 feet uh, descent or more below normal cruising altitudes. It is important to note that even during the most severe solar radiation storms, the amount of potential radiation exposure on a flight of three hours at a normal cruising altitude is approximately equal to what you would receive from two chest x-rays. And this exposure decreases dramatically if the flight descends below 30,000 feet and flies at a more southerly latitude. Fortunately, as we've heard, major solar radiation storms are very rare, and the last event occurred nearly 17 years ago. However, in today's world of media fear-mongering and rapid consumption of social media, it is entirely possible that the airlines will encounter new and unforeseen challenges when managing the next solar radiation event. Despite all of these well-established procedures which mitigate the safety risks of these events and allow us to continue operating, it could be difficult to control the general narrative and customer perception for such a highly charged topic. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much, Nathan, for that informative presentation. Next, we've all come to depend on power every second of the day without giving it a second thought. And we wanna make sure that the grid can ride out a severe space weather storm. Without special instruments, we can't see the large time varying magnetic and electric fields that impact the grid. So we look forward to hearing from Mark Olson, who is with the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, and he will tell us about monitoring and mitigating geomagnetic storm effects on the electric power grid. Mark? Well, thank you, Howard. Uh, you said it very well. Electricity, it is vital to our society, and that's why we exist here at NERC. Our mission is to ensure the electric grid in the U.S. and Canada is reliable and secure. To accomplish this mission, we focus on the effective and efficient reduction of risk. And I'm excited to speak with you today about how we approach the uniquely challenging risk of severe space weather. The grid is a tremendously complex machine, over 100 years in the making and constantly evolving. Large power transformers are at the heart of the power system. They are connected by long distance transmission lines and networked and controlled by relays, switches, and sensors. Operation of the grid is a constant balancing act to ensure that the electricity that is sub supplied by all generation types can be delivered for its end use in real time. Any disturbances that disrupt this balance when not controlled can cascade and bring the system down. There are many natural threats to grid reliability, ranging from local thunderstorms and tornadoes to regional level wildfire conditions and hurricanes. Severe space weather is uniquely challenging because events can potentially threaten the grid on a continental scale. Short warning times and greater uncertainty when compared to terrestrial weather 
further exacerbate the risk. Geomagnetic disturbances affect the power system by inducing quasi-DC currents in long transmission lines. These geomagnetically induced currents vary depending on latitude, earth structure, and the power grid orientation and design features. During a GMD event, GIC flows through grounded power transformers and offsets the normal magnetizing current working in the core of the transformer. In the presence of GIC, transformers can consume reactive power, which is normally delivered by the transformer to support voltages on the electric system. GIC can also cause the transformer's electrical output to be distorted with harmonic currents, which can propagate throughout the power system and cause switches and relays to trip on sensing an abnormal condition. When tripping occurs to grid equipment that is vital to voltage support during a GMD event, the system is in danger and operators may not be able to respond fast enough to prevent voltage collapse. Just such a condition occurred in North America in March 1989 when a GMD event caused a blackout of the power system in Quebec, Canada. Another concern is that the GIC could damage some power transformers by causing very localized internal heating. Hotspot heating is highly dependent on transformer design characteristics. And the effects also depend on the age and the condition of the transformer. In susceptible transformers, the hotspots can shorten the transformer lifespan or, in the extreme, lead to a catastrophic failure. Because the impact of GMD events on the power system are dependent on many factors, there isn't a cookie cutter solution to addressing the risk. Grid owners and operators consider not only the storm characteristics and earth structure in their area, but also system configuration and topology and system characteristics such as transmission line links, resistances, and power substation grounding resistance. The risk varies significantly across the North American grid, which is why a one-size-fits-all solution will not be the most effective or the most efficient. NERC's reliability standards are one of the tools used in North America to ensure we maintain a reliable and secure grid. And beginning in 2015, we started implementing specific requirements aimed at reducing GMD risks, highlighted on this next slide. Through two separate standards created by the electric industry in consultation with research partners at NOAA, NASA, and Space Weather Canada, the bulk power system owners and operators have an obligation to implement operating procedures that can help mitigate impacts to the power system from severe space weather. They also have requirements to study and design their systems to be resilient during a severe 100-year GMD event. The operating procedure standard EOP-10, in place since 2015, requires over 80 companies responsible for operating the grid to share and disseminate space weather alerts and warnings to all of the players in their operating area and to have steps for operators to take that can keep the system balanced and reliable during the event. Steps could include arranging for additional generation to come online during the solar storm, canceling maintenance on the transmission system that could limit the operator's ability to respond, and preparing for contingencies in critical parts of the system. The GMD planning standard, TPL007, requires utilities and transmission organizations to perform comprehensive GMD studies every five years. These GMD vulnerability assessments include modeling the 100-year geoelectric fields and simulating the GICs at each transformer in their system, and then assessing voltage effects of the GIC to determine if voltage collapse could occur, and assessing at-risk transformer hotspot heating through thermal simula simulations. Corrective actions are required when system blackouts are identified. Measures to correct could include upgrading susceptible transformers, switches, and relays, employing devices to distribute the GIC away from critical transformers, and implementing operating procedures to posture the system for resilience in response to space weather warnings. The industry has come a long way in addressing the unique challenges of space weather, and these two standards, developed and approved for implementation in recent years, represent a big step in reducing the rare and extreme risk from space weather. Thank you.
Thank you, Mark, for that great explanation of the connections between space weather and grid operations. Moving on, NOAA has been supporting human space flights since the earliest days, certainly with the Apollo missions and going on back to earlier missions as well. As we now prepare for human exploration, returning to the moon and going beyond, we're glad to have the opportunity to hear from Carrie Lee from the NASA Space Radiation and Analysis Group. Carrie will be presenting on space weather support for conducting human spaceflight missions. Go ahead, Carrie. Okay, and how do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, the Space Radiation Analysis Group supports NASA's Mission Control Center, Houston, via a back room with, an, uh, with the assistance uh, of its interface with NOAA's Space Weather Prediction Center and direct ionizing radiation environment measurements. TRAG supports both the flight surgeon and the flight director positions. The flight surgeon needs to know about any space weather events that will have a potential health impact on the crew members. This health impact is not limited to the immediate concern of acute effects, but also to the long-term effects such as cancer and cardiovascular disease. The flight director, while ultimately responsible for the overall mission success and well-being of crew members, needs to know if the space weather event has uh, placed any limits on safe, safely operating spacecraft systems or other specific electronic equipment. Therefore, TRAG reports space weather impacts directly to flight surgeons for the risks with respect to crew member health and directly to the flight director for awareness of overall mission impacts. There's often a disconnect between the flight control team, what, what the flight control team hears or reads about current space weather events and its impacts from various internet sources or media news reports and what is truly impactful to the crew and mission. This is especially so when coming out of solar minimum. Since there hasn't been much space weather activity in recent memory, any uptick it can create quite a stir among these external sources. During these times, Shrag, Shrag often finds a need to remind the flight control team members what type of space weather is truly impactful to crew missions. Space weather reports consist of solar flare activity. This is typically given, given in terms of peak flux, coronal mass ejections, often given in terms of speed, and solar energetic particles, given in terms of particle flux. The latter is often omitted or just mentioned as an aside on popular space weather internet sites or in media reports. Since flares and CMEs can have direct impacts to the general public, these are what most often make the news reports. While it is the propped solar energetic particles that have the greatest impact on human space missions. This prompt and high flux of energetic particles can penetrate EVA suits and spacecraft hulls, resulting in additional radi radiation exposure to crew members, which is of primary concern. The next slide, please. As mission, as NASA goes from just flying humans in low Earth orbit aboard the International Space Station to missions to the moon and its vicinity, SHRAG will need to change the way it responds to these solar energetic particle events. One of these changes in this paradigm shift is adding an interface to the uh, Community Coordinated Modeling Center for additional space weather modeling for predict predictive capabilities. On the, on the space station, the impacts are limited to times when the vehicle passes through high magnetic latitude regions where solar energetic particles can penetrate into the geomagnetic field. These passes can occur about once every 45 minutes and last between five and 10 minutes. There are large portions of the orbit that happen each day where the space station is completely protected from these particles. This is around 12 hours per day. This affords SHRAG and the flight control team time to respond to these events and to make crew recommendations. Exploration missions will not have this luxury since most of the mission will be performed well outside Earth's magnetic field region. This means that having better predictive capability and quickly enacting pre-planned flight rules is a must to ensure the crew members keep their radiation exposure as low as reasonably achievable. So in summary, SHRAG is NASA's behind the scenes team that monitors the space weather and reports it 
It reports its impacts on crew health to the flight surgeon and other potential mission impacts to the flight director. TRAG relies on SWPSI reports and forecasts, as well as direct measurements of the radiation environment. Enhanced forecasting capabilities will be required for future exploration missions. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie, for the work you and your team carry out to, to support these exciting space missions. Finally, we come to the Aurora. If we were meeting in person, I would ask for a show of hands to find out how many of you have seen the Aurora. If you haven't, I'd like to encourage you to find an opportunity for watching these beautiful and colorful displays. But next best to seeing the Aurora in person is to hear from our final presenter, Bea Gajardo Lacorte, with the NASA Ionosphere Thermosphere Mesosphere Physics Laboratory. She will cover one of the popular space, one of the most popular space weather phenomena, the aurora. Bea? Thank you, Howard, and thank you for the invitation to talk today. I would like to start this talk by reminding all of you that space weather refers to the conditions on the sun, the solar wind, the magnetosphere, and the ionosphere that affect ground and space based instruments and also human life. And perhaps one of the most visible effects of space weather on Earth are auroras. In this picture, the aurora looks like these two rings around the polar regions of Earth in both hemispheres. In the north, the aurora is called the aurora borealis, and in the south, aurora australis. These photographs were taken in Canada and New Zealand, respectively. Unfortunately, the aurora is often incorrectly defined as when particles from the sun rain down into the polar regions of Earth's atmosphere. However, it is not correct to say from the sun. The correct definition is the aurora is produced when particles from the magnetosphere precipitate or rain down into the polar regions of Earth. And this is important because the real sources come from the solar wind and also from Earth's ionosphere. And when these particles enter the magnetosphere, they undergo several changes. An important thing to understand is how the light is produced in the aurora. The mechanism is relatively simple, and it was first introduced a long time ago by Lars Vegard in 1932. We know that around the Earth we have the atmosphere. The density of particles decreases the further away we go from Earth. So closer to Earth, we have the dense atmosphere. We also know that we have magnetic field lines that connect both hemispheres. And in these magnetic field lines, we have magnetospheric particles that experience, one of the motions that experiences the particle along the magnetic field line. And sometimes these particles encounter the dense atmosphere and collide with its particles. As a result of this collision, the atmospheric particles end up energized. And as any physics system, they don't want to have more energy than the basic state, so they release energy in the form of light. Oh, well, I, I was thinking actually in the particles like more like this. And if we put many particles together, they might resemble some, something that will look like an arc. So we basically have two types of aurora. And these depend on the type of magnetospheric particles. If we have magnetospheric electrons colliding with atmospheric particles, we have the electron aurora. As a result of this collision, we will see in the night sky the green and red light. And these are produced by the de-excitation of atomic oxygen. We also see blue and purple, which is produced by the de-excitation of molecular nitrogen. It is not a surprise that magnetospheric particles excite nitrogen and oxygen, since these are two of the most abundant elements in our atmosphere. Now, if the precipitating particles are protons, then we have the proton aurora. In this case, actually, after the collision, the magnetospheric protons are the particles that get energized, not the atmospheric particles. These protons are usually hydrogen that typically produce light in the two Balmer emission lines, the H alpha and H beta. A really important thing to highlight for those of you that have seen the aurora or might see the aurora in the future is that I can guarantee that what you are seeing is electron aurora because the proton aurora is not visible for the naked eye. You need a special instrument to detect it. And the auroras are not exclusive to Earth. We also observe auroras in other planets. Here on the left, we have the aurora in Jupiter. This is an ultraviolet image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. The right image is the aurora observed in Saturn. This is an X-ray image taken by NASA's Chandra mission. So today, I have tell you a big deal about what we know about the aurora. But there are still many things that we don't know in the, in the intense research. For example, we don't understand what determines the scale size of our structures for quiet and dynamic arc. We also don't know how the energy of the accelerated electrons depend on the acceleration mechanism. And also, we know that 
um, there are structures that look like Aurora, but they're not Aurora, such as the case of Steve, a topic I'm really, really passionate about, and that maybe you have seen around. We have recently discovered that Steve is not Aurora, which makes it even more interesting and help us to highlight the importance and the impact of space weather on Earth. Thank you. Thank you, Bea. I agree with Howard that it's a it's quite a thrill to see Aurora in person. It's now time for questions about this last section. What questions do you have for these presenters? Bethany? Thanks, Kelly. Um, yeah, we've got a couple of really good questions. Uh, and Carrie, the first are, are kind of directed to you. There's two that are pretty similar, so I'll I'll kind of combine them. Um, so first, how much lead time do you need for a major radiation storm when astronauts are on the surface of the moon? And then what are the plans to protect the crew if solar particle event were to happen? Well, I, I think how much lead time we need and how much we would like to have might be two different things and how much we're able to get. Uh, but what we're, what we're working on is, is trying to get something that's a, an all clear forecast. Uh, meaning that um, the, the, there's nothing threatening on the sun, and so we would like to be able to have a 24-hour all-clear forecast, such that we can tell the flight director uh, and and the and the crew members that there is no there's very little concern for the next 24 hours to continue operations. Uh, if there is a large region on the sun uh, that is threatening, we would like to for the models to be able to improve. Um, to to be able to give us these, you know, in the next uh, uh, eight hours or so, you could you could potentially see a large event, and and uh, to have confidence that, um, that that large will actually come to fruition, so that we don't have a lot of false alarm rates. You can imagine it's very expensive to have these uh, uh, missions out there, and we don't want to make the astronauts stay inside from a very important EVA or other uh, operations that they need to be doing uh, that uh, for, for an event that doesn't happen. Great. Well, thank you, Carrie. Mark, this next question is for you. Do power companies take their own measurements of magnetic storms? Uh, thank you. That's a good question. Um, so uh, power companies uh, all use the space weather information from uh, SWIPSI here in the in the U.S. and in Canada they use Space, uh, space Weather Canada. Uh, power companies uh, many also have uh, geomagnetically induced current monitors on the system, so they'll use GIC uh, measurements uh, and then can uh, base some decisions on that or understand the environment um, a little better with that. Uh, some uh, companies are uh, introducing magnetometers uh, into their um, areas, so putting magnetometers on the ground. To, to, um, but primarily, uh, those are not for operator information as much as they are for um, uh, uh, after the event, uh, going back and try and working to validate their system models. So you want to have uh, good information of the uh, 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 magnetic fields uh, near your system, and uh, and then uh, with some GIC information and your system models, you would try to uh, analyze. Uh, and, and um, validate that model and, and see how uh, everything uh, makes sense. So um, there is some measurement information that uh, operators uh, are using, but uh, in terms of our uh, mitigation, uh, our, our operating procedure standard, it's really the uh, this, uh, Space Weather Prediction Center is, uh, is the primary source of, uh, of the information that uh, the, the U.S. Uh, power grid operators are, are looking to. Great. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Nathan, question for you. Uh, what's the impact of reverting to a non-optimal routing due to a space weather event? Yeah, so um, when we operate those flights uh, over the pole, as you saw in my first graphic, uh, we are operating very close to the, the, the limits of the airplane. Uh, so a, a Newark to Hong Kong over the pole is, you know, a 15 plus hour flight time. Well, if we're not able to use the polar route, um, there's another route that you can use that's just below the polar uh, latitudes, 
adds another 30 to 40 minutes to the flight. And that's the difference between being able to operate the flight nonstop or having to uh, plan a technical stop or a fuel stop uh, along the way. Um, and one of the things that over the last few years, the airlines have had to deal with is new crew duty restrictions, uh, crew fatigue management systems that we've had to implement. So uh, if a crew is not able to operate uh, the route as, as normal, they become illegal to operate the route period. And so uh, we essentially have to change crews in another city uh, and it, it causes a, a pretty significant disruption to that flight as well as all the flights downline of it uh, on that aircraft. So obviously safety is our primary concern uh, and we would cancel a flight rather than try to operate it uh, at some sort of margin. Uh, and so our, our system and our policy and our procedure are very uh, attuned to being able to manage uh, these types of events. But yes, it's um, um, if, if we get caught up in one of these events, it's most likely gonna be a canceled flight or one that is significantly delayed. Thanks, Nathan. Let's see, uh, Bea, this next question is for you. I've had a couple of folks uh, chime in and uh, want to know a little bit more about Steve. So, um, so Steve is this purple-like arm that occurs a greater world of the aurora low at a lower latitude. So it's, people will more often see it because it's where more populated, populated areas in North America and South America are. Um, this purple structure looks really like an aurora it moves extremely fast but when um we studied it with one of the NOAA satellites we realized that there is no particle precipitation associated with steam which means it's the ionosphere that is creating the, the luminosity locally okay thank you and another question that came in for you um actually i guess it's a two-part uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, where do you recommend to go to see the aurora? And then when are they most visible? So the aurora is an always present phenomena. Whenever we have a clear atmosphere and low um, light contamination, we will see the aurora. It, the, the most dynamic aurora that happens after what we call a substorm uh, can happen several times per night. We need it to be dark, so the winter in the polar regions is the best time. And in terms of where, um, I will highly recommend an area called um, White Horse in Canada. It has some of the most spectacular images that I have seen of the aurora are coming from that area. But any other place in Canada, like Alberta or Alaska, too, are very good places to observe the aurora in the Northern Hemisphere. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to open it back up to questions from um, the entire panel, from the entire webinar. Um, so I'd like to go back and, um, Bob, ask you a question about, um, sorry, let me scroll back up here, um, about extended kind of long range forecast time. So are there ways being researched to extend out that long range forecast time? Yeah, I think. So the, uh, in the space for the business, it really does, going back to what I said, it starts with that eruption. So I, sometimes when I explain this, it's hard to do in the short version, the five minute version. Sometimes it's more useful to think about this as like a volcanic eruption rather than a hurricane where we've you know made great progress and those systems have some momentum. Space weather really is an eruption driven uh, system. So you, you know what are the limits in that? I'm, I'm not sure I could, I could say I have high hopes that we'll we'll get to some of these pre-eruptive signatures, um, and a lot of you know very bright minds out there working on those those issues. But really, for the immediate future and for the near future, I think we're really still in that kind of um, that whole sequence that I described. I mean, certainly we're one of the biggest things we're trying to get to is is getting that magnetic field information ahead of time to increase that lead time uh, on that geomagnetic storm phenomena. But um, although we're working on it, I don't think there are any major paradigm shifts uh, coming in the near term. Great, thank you. Um, and next question, uh, Terry, this is related to observations, so I'll, I'll throw it your way. Um, 
Uh, are there observation satellites that are going up, um, planned U.S. missions or international partners that could give us more data points? Yes to all of those. Uh, they're, they're, we rely heavily. Uh, one of the satellites I mentioned was the NASA ESA SOHO satellite. Uh, we rely heavily on uh, a lot of the, the NASA satellites uh, that are launched because uh, their primary purpose is for scientific investigation, but very often NASA has put in a real-time download from those satellites, and very often those measurements are, are also useful for our forecasters and for our models. And in addition to that, uh, there are a number of international missions, both from uh, research agencies like international space agencies, but also from our partner operational space weather organizations. And they're putting up energetic particle sensors, magnetometers, uh, imagers, various instruments uh, that we as much as possible then try to incorporate into our models and our products and services. Great, thank you. Bill, I've got a question that's come in for you. Do you think there is a way for us to, um, to, to be less reliant on systems that would potentially be affected by space weather? Sorry about that. Is it possible to protect these systems somehow from the impacts of space weather? Yes, uh, and that's a big part of our approach to building resilience. It's kind of a two-prong approach, and the grid is a good example. We the grid, will, the grid industry folks will develop operational procedures in response to space weather war warnings and forecasts. But the other, the second prong of that approach is how much can we engineer around the problem? Obviously, if we can build transformers that are more resilient to the geomagnetically induced current, we are in a better place. And maybe Mark can chime in on that, but there's certainly efforts on the way to ensure that the grid is um, more hardened uh, to, to um, yeah, protect against the geomagnetic storms. Mark, would you agree? Yeah, definitely. I think um, that, that was one of the reasons why uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and, and NERC took the approach that they did with a operating procedure standard and a planning standard where you're looking uh, in operating, uh, you know, mitigating in real time, but in the planning, you're looking downrange and trying to find uh, where opportunities to harden the system are for, for the design for the design uh, basis event that we're uh, uh, going for. So yes, uh, I, I definitely agree. And just just to point out one other technology uh, applicable here to this question is GPS. GPS systems were considerably more vulnerable several years ago but uh, and with, certainly with single frequency, but with dual frequency capability and other advances in the GPS satellites, we've mitigated a lot of, not certainly not all, but a lot of the um, vulnerabilities to space weather. Well, thank you both. Um, this next question, I think is probably best suited for Carrie. Um, how do we protect, protect astronauts from cosmic rays? Uh, so from solar energetic particles, we can we can help protect them on a uh, on the um, uh, MPCV vehicle or the vehicle uh, exploration vehicle that's going um, uh, towards the moon that will transfer the crew members to the moon. Uh, we have them get into a shelter and uh, take all the stowage and they pile it around them uh, to produce a a shield for a solar particle event. Uh, the galactic cosmic rays, on the other hand, are very energetic, and there's really nothing we can do about uh, protecting the crew from them on uh, on a vehicle with such little mass. Got it. Uh, and and another question for you. Um, historically speaking, were early manned flights conducted with the knowledge of potential impacts of space weather? Uh, and then when was space weather first taken into account during spaceflight missions and satellite construction? Uh, they were aware of space weather, and they were aware of the, particularly the radiation belts. Uh, the Apollo astronauts and, their, um, and each of the Apollo missions 
had uh, radiation detectors uh, on them and they um, sent back uh, the data as they went through the uh, the radiation belts, which were the of primary concern. I'm sorry, can you, what was the, the remainder of that question? Um, when was space weather first taken into account during space flight missions and satellite construction? All right, so in, in terms of uh, when we take it into account for crew members, um, I, I think it's more, more seriously taken into account for these longer duration missions since we've had the ISS up there for the last 20 years. Um, it was a concern during the, the shuttle days, but of course those were very short missions. Um, so I, I think it's been more of a concern for the longer duration missions and, uh, and has gotten more and more um, eyes on it since then, simply because it's more radiation exposure for longer uh, periods of time. Great, thank you. Um, and that, Kelly, it's probably about it for now. Um, we've heard so many wonderful presentations today um, and some really great questions. And uh, thank you all for, for contributing to, to today's webinar. Yes, uh, thank you everyone. That wraps today's five minute thesis webinar on space weather. Uh, many thanks to our panelists today. And I hope you all um, for in the audience have enjoyed these excellent presentations as much as I have. At the end of this session, a few brief questions will appear on your screen. Please take one more minute to respond to these. Your feedback is crucial to help us plan future webinars like this one. And also as a reminder, this webinar was organized by the NOAA Central Region Collaboration Team. And if you'd like to learn more about us, check out our webpage at www.regions.noaa.gov central. And it's on that website where you'll be able to find the recording for today's webinar. We're going to post it early next week. And you're welcome to share it once it's posted with anyone you'd like, teachers you know, uh, space weather enthusiasts. If you have any questions, please uh, send an email to bethany.perry at noaa.gov. Thanks again, everyone, for your participation and have a great day.